I have started the recording. Yeah. All right, now I have to figure out my um hold on, let me move it over. Can you see my screen? I cannot. What is where this is? You can see me, right? I can see you. Yeah. If I go start from the beginning, so we have to be able to see my screen. So yeah. Oh, of course I have to share. That's why. Hold on. <laughs> yeah. Share screen. It looks looks like screen sharing should be an option. Do you see there we that? go. Yes. If I go on presentation mode, there we go. Perfect. Awesome. Cool. We've got it. We're we're here. We're set up. Yeah. The only problem is, is my presentation is here, so they're going to um, see the side of my face. Yeah. Double double monitor situation. I wonder if I can change the screen. Um, if not, you know what? I'll just keep it as it is. Maybe I'll just move this screen over. No, because it's still my monitor. My my screen thing is there. Well, are you going to be able to hide my face? <laughs> uh, we, we can... <laughs> If you want, you can turn your video feed off. Um, I'll probably have mine off unless we do Q and A. But otherwise, um, I think it's all right, and you, I'm sure it'll still still be a great presentation. And yeah, all right, we'll figure. You can see my becoming an employer in Maine. You can see that screen, correct? Yes. Oh. That's all that matters. Okay. All right. Oh, we're ready. Yeah, if you're if you're ready, I'm I'm ready. We can get things going here. Yep. Yeah. All righty. Well, thanks everyone for joining Score Maine today, and welcome to our workshop on becoming an employer in Maine, hiring your first employee. Score is a resource partner of the Small Business Association, and we've got we can help all clients uh, throughout every stage of the business cycle. And we uh, would love to have your questions throughout the event today. Uh, feel free to either queue them up in the chat, uh, queue them up in the Q&A tab, or uh, if you want to get a little more in-depth, we can also invite you to speak with, by using the raise your hand function. And yeah, we're joined and by Danielle today. She's our expert on this topic. She's uh, very knowledgeable on the subject. And I hope that everyone has great value from this workshop. And Danielle, why don't you take it away? Perfect. Hi, thank you. Thank you for joining. Um, we will just jump into the presentation. Um, but congratulations on thinking about hiring your first employee. That's very exciting. Um, so let's just talk about the next steps and what that looks like. Um, so hopefully you can all see my screen. So as um, Jasper said, if you want to add your name and the nature of your business into the chat box, if you have any questions, add those into the chat box. Um, and then hopefully we can address any questions you may have today. Uh, and then again, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn as well if you want to, um, you know, go beyond this presentation. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Danielle Nemeth, and I've been in HR for well over, over 20 years of experience. I have a master's in organizational leadership, a bachelor's degree in human resource management. I am a volunteer SCORE mentor. It has to be one of my favorite jobs ever. Um, I am from Maine born and raised in Lewiston, and I have my own consulting company called Anna's Coaching and Consulting, and where I do HR and small business consulting. Um, so this is kind of what our agenda looks like today. We're going to talk about um, when you're hiring, we want to apply for an EIN number. We're going to talk about cost consideration. We'll talk about job descriptions and job classifications, as well as employee handbooks and why get employee posters. Um, and then we'll talk about the new hire process, what that should look like, 
and the hiring process itself. It's a lot of dry material, so I apologize in advance, and it's very high level material, right? So if you have more in-depth questions, again, add it to the chat box or feel free to, if it's after the fact, reach out. We're totally good with that. Um, so first things first, you need to have an EIN number, and the EIN number is the way you pay your taxes on your business. So if you think about an EIN number, it is like a social security number for your business. Uh, you must obtain a federal employer identification number. You can apply on irs.gov. It is free to do so, and it's supposed to be instantaneous. So um, don't quote me to that because you know the IRS, but um, it is supposed to be uh, instantaneous. So, and then once you have that EIN number, you want to register with me Revenue Services, um, and you want to also register it with the Department of Labor. Labor, And again, um, you'll obtain that tax ID number to pay your employees, to pay your payroll taxes, that those type of things. Um, and I know I'm moving rather quickly, uh, but we have a lot of material to cover. Um, so, we are thinking about hiring our first employee. Okay. Um, we should really start thinking about the cost of hiring that employee because it's more than just salary. So if you're like, oh, I can afford $20 an hour, it's going to be more than $20 an hour. Um, so it's, it's the salary but it's also mandatory benefits, right? There are some mandatory benefits, even if you don't plan to offer benefits, there are definitely mandatory benefits that have to be offered. Um, some of those mandatory benefits are tax, your, your mandatory tax taxes are um, your workers' comp insurance and your unemployment insurance. And if you're an employee, if you have one employee, you need to be offering those type of benefits. In addition to the salary, and then in addition to those mandatory benefits, you should really think about miscellaneous cost. And some of those miscellaneous costs could be advertising for the position. Advertising for the position can get expensive depending on that position. Think about the administrative cost. Think about the equipment that they're gonna need, whether they're gonna need a laptop, software to support that laptop, are they gonna need a cell phone or cell phone reimbursement? Do you have, are you gonna, are they gonna go from job to job? Are you gonna be needing to uh, pay mileage to them? What is the cost of the paycheck gonna be? And of course the benefit cost. So those are all things to really think about when you're hiring your first employee. And then you have additional considerations. So you've got the cost down, but we we think we're going we think we can do the cost. The cost is great. But now what? Well, we want to set expectations for our employees. We want them to come on board and we want them to know what your culture is like and what you expect from them and you know what what your values are and do those values align with, um, with your business? So you want to be make it crystal clear to them. So I recommend either doing an employee handbook or a code of conduct book. You want to make sure, again, clearly defining those policies, those rules, and those procedures so your employee knows what to expect from you and you know what to expect from your employee. You want to define and tell them what your company cultures like and what are your values? What is your mission for your business? And does the employee align with those missions? Do, you know, do, if you're in nonprofit, do these, your mission and these employees when you're interviewing talk about similar interest um, working in the nonprofit or, you know, similar interests that really align with your business or business industry? Uh, then we want to talk, you want them to know about legal compliance. And some of those legal compliance, if you do an employee handbook, you have to talk about sexual harassment in your employee handbook. You're, you've got to tell them what your policy is, what the expectation is. You've got to tell them what the complaint process is. Um, and you need to be standard and consistent in that message. In addition, 
you want to talk about compensation benefits, PTO, and safety factors in your employee handbook. Um, additional Other additional considerations is your payroll cost. Like, how do you plan to pay that employee? Are you planning to use QuickBooks and pay them yourself or a different software system? How are, are you um, going to write them a check? But how are you going to calculate those taxes? Um, and then, of course, benefit deductions. How are you going to deduct those benefits from their paycheck as well? And then leading into to those, those considerations is actually benefits. What are you going to offer for benefits? You need to give them a list of your summary of benefits, not necessarily in your employee handbook, but onto the side during um, your uh, enrollment or your onboarding process. Uh, you want to show them what choices they have, if any. It could be one plan or you might have a variety of plans. It could be um, what is the eligibility status for your benefits? Do they have to work for you for 30 days, 90 days, 60 days, uh, whatever whatever your um, criteria that you planned with your broker? Um, so you want to make those crystal clear to your employees too. And these are things, again, to think about. Um, Deduction details, how are, you going to, how are you going to pay and what percentage is your employee going to pay and what percentage are you going to play, pay as an employer? And then when you figure that all out, you've got to have enrollment forms and you've got to have forms, right, to, to really to have, make sure it's crystal clear what your employees sign for and what, you, um, what you're going to pay versus they're going to pay and what you can submit to uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield or whatever health plan you have so they know the beneficiaries and the employees that are on boarded with that plan. All right. Also, when you have employees, you need to make them aware of laws. And you have to make these laws very visible in break rooms or in well-visited areas. And some of these laws are falling under the Fair Standard Labor Act as far as the pay expectations, um, Americans with Disability Act, OSHA, which is your safety, workers' comp, child labor laws, equal pay laws. Um, and then, of course, the state has their own laws. So there's like Maine Earned Paid Leave Law. We'll be probably next year getting into um, paid family leave law. So there's a lot of different laws that your employees have to know and have to be displayed. Now, I'm not affiliated with any posters, but you have two choices to display these, these laws. You can go onto every different website and print and paste them to your walls and hope that you have all of them. Or you can look at labor posters online uh, for Maine and federal, and take a look at them. I think it's probably 30 to 50 bucks, and then done. All of your labor laws are in one place. You can sign up. They send you an annual poster every year for the same for minimal fee, and then you are in compliance with your business. So it's important, and, and you have to display it. I can tell you if OSHA walks into your place of business, so one of the first things they're going to look for is what are your posters and are, what are your posters or where are you displaying the labor laws and are they up to date? Um, in addition to that, make sure a lot of people just get these posters and they just boom, put them on the wall. Some of these labor laws on these posters, you have to identify who they are to go to. Like for example, sexual harassment, you'll need to put if you have a sexual harassment case, you'd have to put who do they report to right on your poster in addition to your book, your handbook. So you'd have to put you know, Danielle Nemeth with the contact number so that if somebody's being sexually harassed, they can walk up to the poster and look at a contact and call. Um, so those are things to consider um, as well. And, and, I, and I- You did it. We did have one great question just come in. What if you don't have a physical location, but your employee re works remotely? So there are, you can buy, um, you can buy them virtual posters and they will send them to you and then you can send them out to all your employees. Awesome. Yeah. 
Um, and that's the beauty of going with JJ Keller or a lot of these other companies. Again, I don't have any vested interest in them, but it's the beauty of going with these companies. Or you can print them off yourself, hope you get every single one of the labor laws, and then you can PDF them to your employees all in an email or you know, however you, you wish to roll that up. Um, okay, so a lot to consider, right? We've already talked about a lot, and this is even before we hire our first employee. So we are ready. We've got our posters. We know how we're going to pay them. We have everything, but we think we have everything figured out. So now it is time to post a position. This is the hiring process. Posting the position, screening position, screening for the position, interviewing, selecting the best candidate and making the offer, right? We think we're ready to do that. Um, except we have to get, be prepared for that process. Um, so we want to first identify the needs of the position. So what do we want this person to do? I personally recommend that everything you hate to do have this person do. So if you hate doing books and you hate doing taxes, then hire a person with all of the things you hate to do because you're good at what you do. Um, so have them do what you're not good at and then, then you'll make a great business, right? If you hire someone who's good at that. Um, but you really just need to think about what do you want them to do in that position and write a list of exactly what you want them to do. And then you need to create the job description, right? What are you going to post? How are you going to tell the employee what the job is? So you've got to write that job description. Um, you've got to prepare for interview questions. Then you're going to have to post the job, conduct interviews, select that candidate, negotiate a wage, give them an acceptance letter. If you are in an industry that requires you to run a background check or you, you want to run a vacuum back, background check for safety reasons, you're going to have to hire a company to do that. And then you want to bring them on board, right? Their first day, you want to tell them, here's what the expectations are. Here's what your job is. Here's where you're going to be sitting, all of that good stuff. So let's run through that process. When you are having a, an employee fill out their job application. There is a law called ban the box and ban the box is you cannot ask them about criminal history. And if you look at your job application, they'll say, have you ever been convicted of a crime? That is now illegal to ask. Very few industries are exempt from asking that question. Um, and you don't want to ask that question in the interview process. Right? The way to find out if they've ever been convicted of a crime is to run a background check. Um, and that's the that's the philosophy behind it is, is they gonna, you're going to run a background check, you'll figure it out. Um, if they bring it up, of course, you can probe it during the interview process, but you don't want to just bring it up yourselves. Um, so when we are creating, back to our job description, when we're creating our job description, we really need to figure out if this position is exempt or non-exempt. So if you classify it wrong, it could come with some serious consequences. So the components of a job description are exactly what it looks like here. You want to figure out the job classification, exempt or non-exempt. You want to put the reporting manager and what department they'll be reporting to. Um, you want to put a job summary, just kind of a brief job summary of the quality of the qualities of the job that you see. You want to put the responsibilities of the job, you know, and again, you know, be very, I do bullet points and be very clear on those job responsibilities. And then you want to do the qualifications. What Qualifications, do you think they need to do the job? Do they need to do use QuickBooks? Do they need to know how to be a carpenter? Or can you train them? So really exactly what type of education, what kind of skills, what kind of qualifications they need to do the job. And then you want to make them very aware of the physical attributes of the job. 
or the work environment, which is, will they be sitting in an office for a long period of time, or will they be on a construction site with lots of equipment, running lots of noise? Do, do they have to lift, do they, can they, does a job require them to lift 50 pounds, or are they gonna need to, to um, lift more than that? You know, how physical is the job? Is it, are they going to be in a dusty environment? You want, you want to tell them that. You want to be very transparent in this job, this job description. And so that's, there's clear understanding between you and the candidate what the job is going to be. Because this process that we're talking about today, we've, we've gone through everything. We've hired that perfect candidate. And if he or she is not the one, then you start all over again. So that's why um, I am telling you that the best thing for you to be is very transparent, very clear from your employee handbook to your job descriptions. So we have our job description complete. We're going to post it online. Um, so we've identified the position, we've created the job description, we've prepared the interview questions, we post the job, and then um, and then we wanna advertise for that job. So you're posting the job. Again, this is the hiring process. Um, you post the job and then, I'm uh, sorry about that. And then uh, we post the job and then we start looking at candidates. Um, one easy and cheap way to advertise your job is through the career centers. The career centers will pretty much do all the work for you and not charge you anything. Um, is it the best and most effective? There are other effective means out there, but they are cheap and they do advertise the position for you as in cheap as in a lot of their services are free, where indeed, when you uh, post for Indeed, whether you know it or not, but they are ridiculously expensive. Um, ZipRecruiter is expensive too, not quite as Indeed, but there are, it, it does get rather costly to post on job boards. So just be aware of that cost. Um, once you get your candidates, you figure out what candidates you want to bring into your organization to interview, you want to focus on the job interview itself. And the job interview, um, you've got to be careful. There's a lot of legal uh, legal ramifications, or maybe that's not the word I'm looking for, but legally, there's some things you cannot ask on a, for a job applicant. Um, and so you wanna make sure that those questions are focused on your job and the essential functions of your job. Like if you say, you know, they're, they're gonna be a carpenter, ask specific questions about, tell me about a project that you worked on that was successful. Tell me about a failure. Um, tell me where your measurements didn't come out correctly. So those are the type of questions specific to the job. You don't want to start, and, and this is from the very beginning of the, the um, interview process. Let's just say you bring in a candidate and you're making small talk while you're waiting for somebody else to show up who's going to do the interview with you. And you sit there and you're like, hey, how are you? How many kids do you have? You know, what do you do for fun? And the, you, those are, they're answering those questions, even though it's small talk they could say that you did not hire them because they told you they had children or they had a child with disabilities or they had an elderly parent that lives with them. Whatever they tell you, they could say that that small talk uh, disqualified them from the position. Uh, so be very careful about the small talk you're asking. Talk about the weather, talk about something, but don't talk about personal things such as their family, their children, um, I highly recommend staying away from all of those. That's where it gets you in trouble. Again, make it specific to the job. You want to ask behavioral questions. And what are behavioral questions? Um, think about those questions. So you could say, hey, have you ever built a house? And they'll say, yes. Your behavior-based questions are questions like, 
Tell me about an area you made building that house where it's forcing them to talk about their actual experiences. A lot of people will say yes or no, but you really want to ask questions that they talk about themselves, what they did, what their experiences were like, how did they handle that difficult situation? I've seen it a lot where the interviewer does most of the talking and the interviewee sits and listens. And I, I, it happens quite a bit. Um, you as the interviewer, you sit there, you're talking about your business, you're talking about this, you're talking about that. And next thing you know, an hour goes by and you only have like a yes or no couple of questions. You know, and it happens all the time. You want them to do at least 80% of the talking. So behavioral questions will help with that. Um, Again, illegal questions to ask would be anything based on personal characteristics that are related to anything that doesn't have to do with the job. Don't ask about past wages. Um, that is illegal too. And again, don't ask about, have you ever been convicted of a crime? You don't want to ask those questions. It's a call the band in the box um, law. You don't want to ask about their age, their race, their gender, their national origin, marital status, pregnancy status, disability, anything along those lines. It doesn't have anything to do with the job um, it, or, or the qualifications that you need for the job. Um, and I know you could say, well, I don't want to hire somebody that's pregnant because then they'll just be on a leave. Still illegal. Can't do it. Um, so you can't ask about those different types of things. So when you're interviewing, you want to make sure that you're prepared. You want to make sure that you have an understanding of the job and that your candidate has an understanding of what the job is. You want to make sure that the job application or their resume have those qualifications that reflect your job description. So your job description should look like a lot like their resume or the you know, keywords of their resume. Uh, have your list of questions ready. Have your list of questions ready. Be prepared for the interview. And take interview notes. Be careful though, interview notes are considered legal documentation and you can't just throw them out. You have to maintain them for some years. Um, just in case a candidate says you've discriminated against them during the court case, they're gonna wanna see your interview notes. Um, and be careful, don't doodle on your interview notes. Don't say uh, has blonde hair. Don't say you know any personal characteristics or any personal things on those interview notes. Same with the resume, don't doodle on those either. And remember, these things are legal documents that if you have to show in court one day, um, you know they look professional. Uh, and again, let the candidate do most of the talking during the interview process. So when you're selecting a candidate, consider a long-term fit, right? What is the growth potential for them? And then once you figure that, you can extend the offer, run the background checks, and do their references. In Maine, you have to extend an offer before you can do backgrounds. I've seen it where people do try to run the background first. They want to see what the background looks like before they make the offer. You can't. You've got to make the offer contingent on their background. That's your exit of if you hired the wrong candidate or you've hired a candidate and then you discover they have a criminal background. So um, make sure that your offer letter says everything is contingent. You know, this offer is contingent on the background. Uh, and then you want to commu communicate to the other candidates that let them know that they weren't selected for the position. So now you have your candidate, you've done the interviewing process, you've got your employee handbook in place, you've got all your forms in place, you've got that perfect candidate, and now it's day one of the job. So day one, you're gonna have that employee come in at a specific time, and then you're going to sit down with that employee. And this is really important because you want your employee to know what to expect on their first day, who they can see, um, if they have issues, how and when do they have to pick out their benefits. Trust me, if you don't do this on day one, you're going to be end up chasing around through all of this documentation. And then we'll talk about the I-9 too, which um, you have to do within 
three business days. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute. But so, you know, you're going to bring them in for day one for your new hire orientation. So you want to give them an overview of how your business got started, what the culture is, what the visions are, how are they going to help you grow your, your, your company. You're going to have your offer letter, which your offer letter should specifically say what the start date is, what their job title is, what the job classification, exempt or non-exempt. Um, and if you're not sure about that, just ask questions in the chat and we'll cover that. Um, and then you want to make sure it has their starting salary on there, whether it's annual or an hourly wage. Wage. If they're um, exempt, you want to put an annual salary. If they're hourly or non-exempt, you can just put their hourly rate wage. You want to make sure that they're filling out the proper forms, federal and state forms, right? That's your W-4 forms. This one says 2023, but I have to change it to 2024. You need to do their I-9 forms. An employer needs to fill out your I-9 forms within one day of hire. The employee needs to bring those forms verifying that he can work in the United States, he or she, or they can work in the United States. Um, they have three days. They should bring it in on day one, but they have three days to bring that information in. They didn't. After the third day, you need to suspend them until you get that documentation. You want them to fill out direct deposit forms so that way you know how to pay them, where to pay them. You want them to, if you're giving them an employee handbook, code of conduct, any policies whatsoever, you want to have, an, have them sign that acknowledgement form saying they did get it. Again, legal documentation. They can't say they didn't know. It's right in your employee handbook and they signed off as stating they were going to go through and read the employee handbook. And then, of course, you want to give them benefits, right? You don't want to chase them down for your benefits, their benefits. So you want to give them the benefit forms. Like, you know, are you allowing them to have dental insurance or medical insurance? And is there a 90 day waiting period? They can still fill out the forms right then and there, and they'll have 90 days to change it while they're in their probationary period. But you want them to get that forms, have those forms filled out so you don't, again, have to chase them. You forget that deadline. They forget that deadline. Next thing you know, they're without insurance and incidents happens. They need their insurance. And now you've got an employee who has tons of debt because we didn't do what we, we should have done on day one. Um, and then safety, you know, safety. What is Or, or your IT policies, right? You can't look at things, you can't look at certain things on you on your laptop at work? Or what are your safety policies? Are you gonna have bloodborne pathogen if they were working with in healthcare or gonna be working with body fluids? You want them to sign up or have those policies in place. Um, you know, if they're a truck driver, they have to go through the clearing house. So some of these things in place you need to be aware of and, and make sure you have it on day one. Um, and then you need to let them know, who are they gonna train with? Who are they gonna to report to? What time are they gonna report? So those are all things that you really need to have organized for your day one new hire onboarding process. So I've done a lot of talking. Uh, we're 33 minutes into the presentation. I just wanna give you a summary of what we discussed. Um, so we discussed preparing to hire your first employee by applying for your EIN number. We talked about additional considerations like considering policies, payroll and benefits. We talked about the hiring stages. We talked about creating a job description and what your application should not say. We talked about posting the job on Indeed, posting on the job on using the career centers or on other job boards. We talked about the legal interviewing and the impact on that, the things that you can say and not say in an interview, casual conversation, what not to say. We, we already talked about that. Um, we talked about the interviewing process and the selection process itself. Candidates should, again, speak 80% of the time and you should be taking note and just asking those specific questions. You can deviate from those questions, but asking those questions that you already pre-planned in preparation for that interview. 
We talked about the selection process. What qualifications do you want that candidate to have? What it should look like with your job description versus their resume. We talked about those key, those key words. Um, and then we talked about the job offer, what the, the offer letter should say. And then of course, we talked about day one, what open enrollment looks like. So with that being said, I wanted to open it up for questions. Um, if we have any out there, great. I hope it wasn't too fast. I hope, again, it's a high level, very, a lot of detailed information um, in addition to the high level that that is still there to be discussed. We have one from, I believe, Tulud. I hope I didn't mess that up. Um, Tulud's wondering, um, he, he, they're looking to create an application uh, for their job. Um, any tips on that? Yeah, so your standard information, right, is your name, address, that work experience. What is your work experience? Where have you worked before? What are the dates you've worked? You know, how long have they worked in those positions? Um, you can put, ask them for three names for references, have a signature form that they sign, acknowledging that all the information they provided is accurate and complete. Um, so those are, you know, very standard uh, application process. If you want to create your own, just have all of that information. Nice. Yeah, I definitely, you know, get the everyone's information in and it's important to you know, know who, who's applying, you know. Um, uh, we have one from Michael um, on the topic of paying, um, as far as paying an independent contractor. Uh, is that via 1099? So uh, 1099. There anything else about that? Yeah, so independent, and, and, and that pops up in every single time we do one of these, right? Um, right. So your 1099, they would invoice you. Um, be very careful. There are laws around 1099 employees too. You can't really treat them like your own employee, right? You can have a 1099 um, employee, but once you start dictating a lot, uh, start dictating, you know, of course you want them here between eight and five, but once you start dictating, dictating and treating them as an employee, then you're now taking them on as an employee. So you have to be very careful about 1099 employees too, that you can have them, you can have them, you can have them work for you, but just keep in mind that if you if they cross the line of being treated like an employee, then chances are um, you could be liable for some of you know, their taxes, their, their, their liabilities. Because if they're not paying their taxes and then they say, I'm an employee of this, and you're saying, no, no, you were a 1099, and the, and the state comes in, and now you, you're you in this um, situation, it could be that you have to go and pay back taxes of that, because they might say, yes, you are an employee, and you might have to pay those back taxes. So just be careful of that, and you can Google the laws around that, too. I think I might have information, too, I could share. Yeah, if uh, if you if something comes up, uh, if you find if you have anything to share, I can include that in our follow up email for everyone. Um, we've got a few people asking about uh, resources for setting up employee handbooks, forms, I nines, W twos. Any good resources for that? Yeah, so you can go right to um, some of the government websites and get the I nine form. That's a legal form that you want to get. Um, you can go to um, as far as employee handbooks go, um, my recommendation would be to hire a consultant. Um, it, it doesn't have to be expensive. You could do just, yeah, I, I just, I'm just doing one for a very small organization and it, it's not really that expensive. So check with some consultants about how much would they charge. Some will charge a lot, but you know, shop around. Um, I, you know, you could Google handbooks and kind of adopt one too, but be very careful on plagiarism, right? A lot of people work hard to put these handbooks in place. So, um, you know, there's always that plagiarism concern, but I honestly would probably reach out to a professional, um, you know, and have 
an employee handbook done. It doesn't have to be extensive. It's, it doesn't have to cost thousands of dollars. It can be a couple hundred bucks. Trust me, like some of the, to make sure it's legally compliant and your time and energy and putting together a handbook, it might be worth you just reaching out to, to a, a consultant. But, you know, if you can also Google employee handbooks and, and adopt one, just again, be careful of um, plagiarism. Hmm. Great, great stuff. Um, Hans, uh, it's, yeah, I'm just trying to understand Amber's new question. Um, uh, contracting, she's a, Amber's a uh, RN patient advocacy and considering contracting other RN uh, versus hiring them. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, again, it's it's kind of like it's either a 1099, you, you come up, it is a 1099, you come up with a contract, she's going to do this work for you, or they're going to do this work for you, and then, um, you know, they're going to go and do it. So make sure you have a clear contract, probably get an attorney involved with that to make a clear contract that they are a 1099 employee, and be very aware of, you know, uh, not to treat them like an employee. And I'll, I can send out some 10, I'll send Jasper some 1099 information that I have um, or a website that I found a link that you can read through. Absolutely. I'll, I'll make sure to send it out to everyone uh, in our follow-up. Now in our, um, we're also going to be sending out a checklist, uh, mm -hmm. employee checklist. So your onboarding process. So you, we're going to get you organized um, so you'll have that. It's, a, it's extensive. You can pull out verbiage if you want to pull out verbiage or, you know, like if you don't offer benefits, then you can take that right out of your checklist. You can edit. What I'm saying is you can basically edit the checklist like you want, but we are going to send you a checklist to help you organize your first hiring, uh, hiring your first employee. Yeah, uh, Scott is commenting too. The Department of Labor has an excellent website that describes the differences between employee and contractor. Yes, correct. Hmm. Yeah, it'd be a good resource for everyone. All right. Any other uh, questions, everyone? Perhaps. Not looking like it. Uh, do you have anything else, Danielle? Um, the one thing I was thinking about. Um, in this presentation is um, exempt and non-exempt. Does it, everybody, I want to clarify the difference between an exempt and a non-exempt employee. And you can take a look at, you can Google this too. I think at the next presentation, I'll put a little bit more information, but your exempt employee or your salaried employees, they don't, they don't, they don't need, you don't need to pay them overtime. But the, how you classify those is, an easy way is think about, are they doing, making decisions that impact your business? Are they part of management? Do, are they part of, are, and I'm not talking about, um, you know, making a decision on what tool to buy. I'm talking about decisions on, do they hire employees? Do they, do they fire employees? Do they impact your budget? Um, as far as making decisions on budgets, do they control control a piece of your business um, in a man, true management form? Where your non-exempt employees, your hourly employees, are the ones who um, you pay on the hourly basis. They're your worker bees, right? They're the ones who are going to run your restaurant and wait on people, or they're going to uh, be your technicians to go out and fix furnaces or um, be those people who go out and do the task, the important tasks they're given to do, but they don't necessarily make those decisions that really impact the business. So the difference between exempt and non-exempt, I just want to clarify that. So a lot of a lot of people will be like, oh, I'm going to class my exempt and then I'll not pay them overtime. And then if, you know, you get audited Department of Labor, there's a complaint along the way, Department of Labor comes in, they take a look at that and they're like, um, this person is really an hourly employee and they were entitled to overtime pay. And then they're gonna go back through all of your records and they're going to calculate what that overtime pay is. And next thing you know, you have a, a huge bill on your hands. So just be very careful on how you classify um, employees. 
Yeah, very definitely important. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, and if that's all we've got for today, uh, thank you, Danielle. Very important, really important to consider when someone's, you know, in this stage of their business. Uh, don't want to, you know, fall into any of the, you know, the pitfalls that can come with this. Um, and I want to thank everyone for attending today's workshop. Uh, as said before, this workshop was recorded, so we'll be sending you a copy of the slides for review as well as a link to the recording. There'll also be a short survey in that email that we would really appreciate you all filling out. And as a reminder, uh, SCORE Maine, if you don't already have a mentor, uh, you can sign up for one at SCORE.org. It's free, confidential, one-on-one um, -on -one mentoring, uh, whether you're starting or growing your business. And we also want to thank our sponsor for today, uh, the Maine Technology Institute. And, hey. hey, thanks, everyone. Have Bye. a great the rest of your day.